Join me in my latest episode of Lifting All Ships, talking to the founder of the Muzzle Movement, Clara Houston, an entrepreneur, young lady with an inspiring story about how she turned a just a casual idea into a blooming business. conversation we're having thank you very much for your time uh yeah, how are you for keeping having me yeah good thank you yeah thank you so much for having me that's all right my pleasure it was actually um a, a good friend of mine shout out to kate uh, uh who actually suggested that i have this conversation as a as one of the conversations on lifting all ships because she actually has one of your muzzles and raves about oh. it and says how brilliant it is and we've seen her when we've done some sessions bring it a little bring it for a, a particular dog that she has um and it was but to be honest it was the color that was i was most impressed by really i was like oh gosh that's a sexy mark if ever there was one <laughs> so um so tell us a little bit about obviously you you are based in uh, less than sheer near milton marbury and you have created a company called uh the, the muzzle movement yeah um which the name is very much the label uh, in the label is on the name is in the label i should say um yeah. which has which creates really really incredible muzzles but there's probably going to be more to it so tell us a little bit about obviously what you do and how it came to be then yeah so I we sort of launched well I launched the muzzle movement in April 2022 because I previously mm -hmm. I worked in dogs trust so I was a senior training and behavior behavior advisor in dogs trust and I have a master's in clinical animal behavior so I was working with oh, wow lots of dogs that were you know using muzzles to mitigate risk so you know I was supporting dogs that had perhaps injured other dogs injured people were going through court cases as well as having one of those dogs myself so um, my previous point to Tolly was stranger aggressive and dog aggressive um, and so I was looking for a muzzle for him as well as for a lot of the customers or adopters that I was working with and I wasn't able to find something mm -hmm. that the dogs found comfortable enough to wear long term and also something that I liked. Um, so I had a few criteria for what I wanted from a muzzle and I couldn't find any that existed. And so I quite like naively with this like gene where I think I can do absolutely anything <laughs> was like, you know what, I reckon I could make one. Um, so I started posting on Instagram. Initially, it was just to sort of like raise awareness for muzzled dogs because I'd had quite a lot of pushback in the public from, you know, Tolly, my previous dog, wearing a muzzle, sort of feedback like, um, oh, that's cruel, or you should just train him, um, which I found really frustrating. Oh, wow. Yeah, and I, I saw yeah. this posting on Instagram and I saw that a lot of other people were having those same experiences, uh, um, which was really yeah, upsetting. Yeah. So we started off just on Instagram sort of teaching people about like all the different reasons that dogs wear muzzles outside of aggressive behavior. Although, you know, there's nothing yeah. muzzling your dog because of aggressive behavior. Um, and yeah, I sort of teased a prototype of a muzzle that I was going to make for my own dog. And everyone was like, I love that. <laughs> and I was like, okay, well, I guess if people like it, maybe I could make more than just one. Um, and so it kind of spiraled from there, really. I I ended up launching a Kickstarter, which is like a crowdfunding campaign um, where we raised £46,000 in 30 days. And that was with no product whatsoever. Wow. Yeah, we had just a wow. prototype and an idea. Um, and so, yeah, there was 800 people that supported that original Kickstarter, which was pretty much like everyone that I had on my wow. Instagram at the time. <laughs> um and then yeah so amazing yeah they you know they waited eight months some of those people for their muzzles because I had to then figure out how I was even going to make them so I <laughs> I'd pre I had 800 now <laughs> yeah. Yeah. yeah so I yeah so we went from you know zero orders to 800 orders on day one um so yeah we've been like, wow. running ever since yes yeah. so that was we launched three sizes at the beginning three sizes that didn't exist at that point 
Um, so I then had to go and wow. speak to manufacturers and learn about how different processes, you know, different plastics and yeah, <laughs> yeah. Mm. having never manufactured anything in my life. Um, so yeah, we've had a pretty wild journey considering that was only just over two years ago. <laughs> and now we're a team of 11 um, and we ship, um, you know, 2,500 orders every month. So yeah, we've, Wow. Exploded. Oh my God. God. <laughs> that is amazing. Yeah. That is incredible. Yeah. It, we've had a pretty wild ride. Um, and I think that what helped us do so well from the very beginning is because of my experience previously. So, you know, I wasn't just designing muzzles because I thought, oh, you know, I reckon I can make something pretty here. I was designing muzzles because I wanted to make sure that it was functional comfortable you know provided my dog with everything that he should have been able to do like drink pan eat vomit all of the things that like you would consider essential for you know welfare um that i found were compromised in muzzles that i was using previously wow there's there's so many things that like in that just short little snippet of a conversation that jumps out to me the first one is um obviously you you have an extensive background in dog training, dog behavior and understanding. Yeah. But the first thing to say that even professionals and people, in, we're not immune to having, let's say difficult dogs, right? Or challenging dogs. We're not immune to that. Dogs are dogs at the end of the day. You know, I've had a dog that was dog aggressive. I've had a couple of dogs that actually are dog aggressive. And obviously training and education means that I manage it, manage their behavior and hopefully, hopefully allow them to navigate a life that is full and, and uh, you know, has everything they need. But yeah. it's so ironic that I suppose, how did, the, just tell us a little bit about that dog then. So how did he come to be then? Was he from Dog Trust or was he a puppy or? Yeah, so he, I adopted Tolly when he was seven um, and he'd come from Dog's Trust and he was actually a handover from a woman that was fleeing domestic violence in her home. And um, so he came to me with quite a lot of like pre-existing fears um, and some of those were, you know, present when I adopted him and some of those sort of evolved over time, the more confident that he, you know, the, the more he settled into the home. Um, and the sort of pivotal point for us was, uh, you know, I took him to the pub, which again, should be able to take dogs to pubs, that's no problem. But I should have really thought about it a little bit more because I didn't, um, I knew that he could be a little bit fearful of people, but not to the extent that we then found out uh, when he was at the pub and he did bite him on his hand. Um, and so from that point forwards, we chose to muzzle him at all times in public. And he also never went to a pub again, of course. <laughs> um, so, yeah, we, we began working through all sorts of different behaviour modification programmes. And unfortunately, um, when I launched the Kickstarter, Tolly, uh, at the same time, had began to lose the use of his hind legs. Um, so that means right. you know, we were going through this Kickstarter launch where we, you know, we raised ten thousand pounds on day one. Um, but that same day, I took Tolly to the um, a specialist for a CT scan, and he had an inoperable spinal cord tumor, um, and he had to be euthanized mm -hmm. the following day. So he actually never got to wear wow. the muscle that I designed for him. Um, but that size is named after him, and he's in all of our branding. He's the dog that you'll see in everything. But you know, you know something, Clara. <laughs> but I think it's almost bigger than that because like, I, if I look back on my life and my journey, everything happens for a reason. Yeah. That dog came to you for that exact, and it was like his purpose on, you know, I'm a bit woo like that. Oh. His purpose on this planet was to start that off because his life in that time that you had him yeah. has impacted beyond. I mean, if that's not a legacy to that dog, I don't know what is. I that's honestly, good. I mean, it's amazing. Actually, you can get quite emotional thinking about it. Yeah, it, it makes me emotional because he meant so much to me, but he means yeah. so much to so many people now because I think many people, yeah, the thing, what and he will, do you know that I would, yeah, if it wasn't for you, Clara, there would be, you think now, there's every month, there's 2,500 people whose yeah. lives will be changed because of Tolly. Yeah, I mean, that connection, what I find most incredible about that is, um, when people have a dog like that. They often, I mean, obviously you had experience, but they often feel like uh, their world gets smaller. They feel trapped. They feel social stigma. You mentioned in your opening part of the conversation about people judging you for wearing muzzles and sure. the stigma attached to it. 
And yeah. isn't it ironic that something that could be quite um, negative and yeah. some, almost depressing, something so beautiful has blossomed from that? I mean, it's incredible. Yeah, I think so. I, you know, at the beginning of this journey, I could never have envisioned that this is where we would be. And I think looking back, I didn't even know what I had begun when I started. I think I was just trying to do the right thing for my dog. And that threw into something. Yeah, you were just you were yeah. just like so many you were like so many people. You're a well-intended dog owner who purely from the passion and love for their dog, and obviously you're passionate about dogs and welfare and their well-being. Like who would have thought that you stumbled into this incredible yeah. thing that you're doing? Yeah. Um so I mean, I, I mean, I just, it's amazing. I mean, I feel that about dogs that I've owned. The first dog I've owned was a really challenging dog. And if it wasn't yeah. for her, I wouldn't be where I am today. Exactly. And I think sometimes that's the real thing that I want people to take from this conversation. If you're listening to this and you have a challenging dog, I always say to people that have reactive dogs, you have no idea the journey this dog's going to take you on. And people look at you as if they think that you're going to take you to the end of it. It's not that at all. There is something so incredible ahead of you yeah. by working through those challenges and coming up with solutions to make that dog's life bigger. That's it. Yeah. I've I've had two dogs now. And you know, very similar to you, the first dog, who I still have, she's 13 now. Um, but yeah, had such a paramount impact on my life. That's how I even ended up doing the masters in clinical animal behavior that I did in the first place. So yeah, wow. it's just this like ripple effect of like dogs coming into my life and then being like, oh pivot. Now I my whole life revolves around this dog. <laughs> <laughs> so yeah and it's wow. so to be wow. able to support other people you know like rescue is where I am you know most at home um, because I spent seven years working for Dogs Trust so it's nice to be able yeah. to still support rescues in finding appropriate muzzles for their dogs yeah. without actually because yeah. I found towards the end of my time in rescue I was emotionally really fatigued um, right. and right. I I kind of felt like I, I probably have to do something else at this point um, but I still need to be helping rest mm -hmm. because that's what's important to me so this is mm -hmm. a nice extension of that um, to be able to still be a cog in that big machine but just a different cog I, I just want to I want to just draw attention to that because it's a really really important thing that you said I would say anybody that's been involved in rescue fostering I have over the years in in various forms either what I do is I take rescue dogs on that for rehab training, et cetera, or fostering dogs. It is absolutely an emotionally, it can be a very emotionally draining process when yeah. you realize sometimes that your efforts aren't going to lead to the outcome that you want. Sometimes you feel, you know, humans have failed the dog. Sometimes you feel like there's this incredible dog. It just needs the chance. There's so many things that feel uh, you know, that, that you have faced with shout out to people that work out in rescues because you guys are absolutely doing an incredible job yeah. in really Sexism really moment. challenging time yeah particularly yeah the, absolutely. yeah my um, i really felt for everybody in rescue when you know the xl bully ban was announced and i just thought wow i could not have been yeah. more devastated for you know not just yeah. the people in rescue obviously or you know the hundreds the owners of and the dog exactly yeah, i mean yeah. i i have but do you know what i think exempted bully <laughs> he's actually not a bully but he yeah. is he fits the criteria he's on the floor next to my feet that's why I'm <laughs> gesturing at him but he yeah he's currently yeah. exempted I'm hopeful that he will be able to be unexempt in the future once they are a bit more clear about um the type but he mm -hmm. is at the moment yeah he's mm -hmm. met all of the exemption criteria and um, wears a muzzle all the time outside of the home yeah so. yeah so I mean you're absolutely right. And we're going to obviously discuss the XL bullies shortly. But I just I think sometimes rescues don't necessarily get the acknowledgement. They pick up the pieces often where, you know, society has either failed dogs or can't cope with dogs or for whatever reason, dogs end up a rescue. And often rescuers have to weed through the troubles, the woes, the, the challenges, the issues and make really, really, really challenging decisions like you know, is this suitable for rehoming? Is this, you know, and it's it's horrible. It's yeah. an all, you know, it's a really, really emotive area. So definite shout out to them. So obviously you mentioned the XL bully legislation, which came into play. Um, oh gosh, when I, I can't remember the, when it, January, the month well, was it? Yeah. Um, it was January that they had January to apply, but they were wearing the muzzle by the 31st of December. Yeah. Yeah. 
Yeah. So January this year, we saw the, the, the official legislation around XL bullies. An XL bully is a, a type of breed that originally derives from America, which is uh, a uh, what's the best way to describe them? A more uh, they're they're a modified version of a um, a pit bull type. Let's be really truthful. Okay. And as a result, they have um, been subject to like so many dogs. Uh, you know, uh, let's be honest, unscrupulous breeding, uh, mm -hmm. poor and lack of understanding about what they are. And as a result, there's been like so many dogs, um, uh, unfortunate instances where they have been involved. And as a result, the government have uh, implemented legislation, which means that the dogs are subject to certain criteria, including wearing a muzzle in public at all times. Yeah. Um, so it was obviously you didn't know when you started your business that that was going to be uh, 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 a result. But how has that affected your workload and your what you do? A huge amount so we I mean obviously didn't know that this was coming and people have joked and been like yeah. Hannah you saw this coming no way I would never ever have yeah. like considered that they might add another dog to the banned breed list um, but for us we have always sold internationally and from the very beginning mm -hmm. the majority of our people that backed our kickstarter were international rather than UK and I think that's probably because right. outside of the UK we are much more um, forward thinking on our perception of muzzles so for example Europe right. dogs are required to wear muzzles on public transport so when you see a muzzle a muzzle dog out in public the immediate thought is not that that dog is somehow um, a bad quote aggressive. dog or yeah aggressive dog mm -hmm. it's that actually that's a normal mm -hmm. part of everyday life in those countries so there isn't this perception yeah. of what that dog might or might not be or at least as much of a perception um, and the same with the states, there are dogs over there that have to be muzzled. Um, you know, maybe it's state specific laws, maybe it is public transport. Yeah. So they're a bit more further, they're a bit more open minded as to why a dog might be muzzled. Whereas in the UK, we don't have that type of law. The only laws where muzzles are required is because that dog is yeah. you know, labeled as a, an aggressive yeah. breed. So yeah. what we found was the majority of our customer base up until sort of, you know, December, well, yeah, December time was international. And that's because, you know, they were looking for muzzles that could be worn in all sorts of different contexts. Um, and then mm -hmm. obviously when the XL bully ban was announced, um, we were inundated. I mean, inundated. We held um, fitting days and we still do hold fitting days even now where the public come and, you know, they can have a, mm -hmm. they can be sized for a muzzle at our unit by professionals who are comfortable with dogs with all sorts of challenging behaviours. Um, yeah. And they were full. You know, we we had people waiting for months to get their bully on one of our fitting days. And even now, wow. people traveling eight hour round trips um, to get an appropriate fit for their bully. So, yeah, we a lot of people are like, oh, did you start because of the bully ban? No way. Yeah, we were here way before. But I think we weren't really um, known, I suppose, in the UK until the XL bully ban sort of brought muzzles to the front of people's, com you know, the conversations that were happening around muzzles researched then um but since then and it's uh, you know what uh, sorry uh, Clara, I just interrupted you the irony is it, it's a blessing and a curse it's a really uh, difficult because from a business point of view you go wow isn't this brilliant I have people wanting my product but from a dog lover and a professional with your background yeah. you're it's a real conflict isn't it because yeah. you go actually I don't want to have this problem to help people with I'd rather there wasn't an Excel bully ban so that people didn't have the product but at the end of the day, it is what it is. If I can create something that's going to be comfortable, ethical, um, uh, humane for the dog, that's going to make their owner's life better and the dog's life better, if I can service that need, why would I not? Yeah, so the, when the bully ban was announced, and, or at least there was there was talk about the bully ban in sort of as early as September last year, my yeah. first thought was, obviously, after that is awful, um, is that there just aren't muzzles that exist for this size of dog they don't they haven't designed muzzles that are supposed to fit a dog of that size muzzles have been stagnant or the same for such a long time you know I think we probably all know a Baskerville and Baskerville haven't adjusted their design for tens of years and they definitely yeah, yeah, weren't yeah. designed for dogs that big we didn't you know they just weren't thought in the design so we already had a size that was on the way um because it takes us much longer than you know a few months to design a size it's sort of like a six to eight month process 
of you know eight different versions hundreds of different dogs try it on before it actually like gets released to the public and um, so we'd already been working on a bully size because the majority of our customers were in the states and they have XR bullies over there um, so that was again just another one of those like serendipitous moments where actually the work that we were trying to do for the dogs that were in the United States has directly impacted the dogs here in the UK. Yeah. 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 That's amazing. So so what is it that in what ways does your muzzle differ from your competitors? Let's plain devil's advocate, you know, um, why would I come to you? Yeah, I love that question. <laughs> So uh, first off, I think we came at muzzle design from an angle that, you know, no muzzle manufacturer has before. And that is from 70 plus years of combined experience in rescue. So we knew that we wanted to be able to design a muzzle that was going to be able to have the capacity to continue training through, which is so simple. Like when I was in rescue, yeah. I cut the front off Baskervilles or cut the yeah. front off yeah. the Greyhound. We modified them. Yeah, yeah, so that you could treat yeah. through them. And it's so like I was sat there thinking it's so simple I just want to be able to feed my dog whilst they're muzzled like if I'm going to work <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. complex not things, a lot to ask is it yeah <laughs> yeah it's not yeah. a lot to ask yeah. Yeah. yeah so every muzzle has a purpose-built treat hole that means you can continue to train yeah. whilst the dog is muzzled so you can mitigate risk but that doesn't mean that you can't train at the same time um, they're yeah. also designed to make sure that the dog has loads of pant room so dogs need to be able to pant so that they can regulate their body temperature if we are not able to let them pant we are restricting what they feel would be normal and also limiting their ability to sort of like have any autonomy over their temperature <laughs> which is like you know, and that's going to increase their stress levels which is going to then cause them to be more anxious absolutely. and it's definitely a downward spiral yep absolutely yeah. It has a huge knock on effect and overall fit of the muzzle. So if you are spending hours and hours and hours counter conditioning or introducing a muzzle for the first time, but you're working against something that is inherently aversive, which is lack of ability to move a mouth <laughs> or lack of ability yeah. to get food or difficulty getting food that causes frustration, yeah. knock on effect yeah. your muzzle training for longer. And for me, in a rescue scenario, the longer that dog is being muzzle trained, the longer it's in kennels and therefore not getting homed. And the higher yeah, not being home. Yeah, yeah. The higher the risk is of additional behaviours popping up that perhaps yeah. will have if that dog yeah. is get out. Yeah. So yeah, being able to design a muzzle that was designed specifically for comfort and to allow the dog to do mm. normal natural behaviours was like pr priority over you know ease of manufacture how much money i can make on them in fact you know like at the beginning i was like i don't even care if i make money i'm just going to make loads of muzzles because <laughs> um, the goal was not to build uh you know a business the goal was to just serve oh, yeah. the needs of dogs <laughs> that's the problem yeah yeah and do you know the ironic thing is just on that point is you know um when i speak to to business mentors and the ones that i really respect it always starts from a genuine idea with good with the right intention. If you go into it going, How, right, I'm going to do this the other way around. How do I make as much money as I possibly can by creating a muzzle? Those things always end up imploding and they don't work and they, and they don't create that sense of community and they don't, in my mind, have longevity. Whereas if you work it the other way around, okay, what is it that these people are lacking? How can I help them? And as a result of that, can I now build a business from that point? The point is such a, for me, that's the way in which we should, all businesses should be run. So yeah. talk us through the, the um, like the various like things that you, because I'm sure it wasn't all plain sailing. What was the process then to get to where you were? Yeah. I knew you'd laugh at that one. Yeah. <laughs> business is never plain sailing. Yeah, it's been the biggest roller coaster ever. <laughs> we have had like high highs, low lows, but it's always been yeah. a big passion project. So it hasn't felt like hard work, even when it's hard. Um, but I think for us, sort of our like highest moments are being able to sort of support XL Bunny Guardians to be able to find muzzles that their dogs are comfortable wearing and the feedback that we get when they've been sort of struggling through with alternatives and swapping to ours and being like, this is the first time I've walked my dog in eight weeks. Like, you know, that sort of thing is wow. it's amazing. And then some of our sort of lowest lows, I would say we have an affiliate scheme whereby, you know, um, horse free businesses can 
have a code and promote our business on you know their social media in exchange for store credit so it was designed with rescues in mind so that if they were you know talking about our product to customers or adopters they could in turn stock their own rescue with muzzles at no expense um, but we opened it up when the money ban happened and we sort of broadened it a little bit more so that you know more people had access to reduced cost muzzles um, but as a consequence we had quite um, specific stipulations in place for being part of our affiliate scheme and one of those is that you don't promote the use of aversive tools um, and we did have an affiliate that you know quite brazenly broke that rule so we redacted our you know, affiliate scheme yeah. um, but that did that was a really really difficult time because we had sort of about four weeks of um, a quite a small group of people that were really, really trying. I mean, it was a boycott, I suppose you could, it was kind of this cancel culture um, where, you know, we had hun hundreds of one-star reviews on Trustpilot, staff, you know, a te the team here was like really, really upset. We could not, we had people that were coming to threaten to show, us, show up at events and everything um, because they were wow. so angry that we were a muzzle company. So what did we have to do with, you know how how could we decide whether you know we should be promoting aversive tools so that's probably our biggest low but also like a big high as well like we stood by what we believe and we stood by our ethics and morals and we wanted to make sure that oh you know what clara you're, you're i just love that you said that you know what and there's a phrase that says um stand for something or fall at anything yeah and you know what there's so many times i know i've had this uh, similar in various situations where um you're there's um what's the phrase is um not a phrase where you're given sort of cho uh, choices and also um forks in the road and it really does attest who you are at the core so the easiest thing for you to do is to go do you know what? We're going to still be making money off them. And yeah. the universe, do you know what? Let's just turn a blind eye because do you know what? My bank balance is going to be affected. And good for you for standing in your truth and standing in who you are as an individual. And honest to God, I just love that. I love that so much because I think so many people wouldn't, if I'm being truthful, they probably wouldn't have made that decision. Yeah. Um, and you and you and your business and your community will be better for it. Good for you, Clara. Yeah, I hope so. It was so stressful at the time though. Like, unbelievably stressful having built this business and having 11 staff that rely on you and then to be like oh no I could just lose it all here <laughs> yeah. so but so how let's, yeah. uh, the thing I'd like to really ask you is because I think that's something that isn't talked about enough is life isn't always frolicking in the daisies and it's always you know it's like singing uh, you know uh, uh, you know nursery rhymes and holding hand in hand and everything's wonderful it doesn't work like that so that was what I would call a test and a challenge. How did you as an individual um, deal with that? And also as a business owner and an entrepreneur, like you said, you've got people relying on you yeah. that come to you and said, Cara, you know, great with your morals and ethics, but I've got to pay my bills and pay my mortgage yeah. and you are my employer. They yeah. may not have said that in so many words, but that would have been That's going in your, in your head. Sure. <laughs> yeah. yeah. How, did you, how did you navigate that then? What did you do as an individual? I think as an individual, I had to make sure that I was proud of the decision that I made, because if I could back me, then that's that's it. That, you know, as long as I could stand by something that I believed in, that was the right thing to do. Then I felt happy with that. But what I found really challenging was navigating with the team to make sure that I, you know, uh, everyone here is on the same page. We're all force free. A lot of them have huge amounts of experience in rescue. So they were also you know of the same process they thought you know actually yeah we can't stand by and just ignore this we have terms and conditions for a reason um yeah. but you know the worry for them was you know this is this is their job some of them had just quit their nice safe secure jobs to come and work here in this new startup that's exploded in two years you know so it was already high risk for them and then to come in and be like oh by the way guys also everything you read online about us at the moment is not going to be nice <laughs> um it was difficult but I think we really had to focus on the people who did get what we were doing and why so we had so much as much negative feedback as we had we had the same positive and more but it's quite hard to focus on that positive stuff when you're getting all this negative stuff so I think we just had to as a team 
agree that we were just going to absorb all of the nice things that people were saying about us and just be really open and honest with each other about like if we were feeling a bit worried about something um that we just had to talk it out and you know out the other side of it we're all really proud of you know the way that we handled that situation because we didn't you know we didn't publicly retaliate we didn't you know call out this person we had a held high and we were like you know it is what it is at this point we've stood by ourselves and we don't need to get involved in drama but there was a lot you know like all over TikTok everything <laughs> and everywhere you looked it felt like we were like topic of conversation which you know they say some all the publicity is good publicity we didn't need that you know we didn't want that it's the energy that it brings but you know something that's really intriguing me about you is um because obviously as I said this is the first conversation I had and you said several things that really do jump out at me and I go one is that belief system that like when you when you um first came up with this idea you came up with this you said um there's something in you that's that goes oh why don't I just have a go that's one thing uh, or, uh, try this with this random idea that's one two is there must be something in you that has um incredible leadership qualities because to navigate a, a ship through stormy waters yeah. is a testament to the individual so where does that come from then Clara I mean are you just incredibly do you have a lot of self-belief do you are you just you know when is that your upbringing where does that come from that's such a nice question. I don't think I get, I don't think I've ever been asked that. Um, so I think I get my delusional self-belief and ability to <laughs> overcome anything. I get it from my dad. So my yeah. dad had his own business. I lost my dad to cancer in 2020. So throughout all of that, I, th I feel like I have been through the hardest thing that I'll ever go through. So everything after that is easy. You know, like every struggle after that point it you know it pales in comparison so it's easy to be able to be like ah but you know what would my dad do in this scenario well certainly not sit and cry about it so let's go <laughs> and I think I do a lot of what I do is because I I really want to make sure that like I'm I'm making him proud so I think well I can't let down I can't let him down now I've got to push through all these people depend on me the dogs out there that are waiting for their muzzles they depend on me and I want you know I want to be able to say I did something really really cool and it you know made a big difference so what was your dad's name Clara Colin Colin yeah. Clara, Colin shout out to Colin Houston watching Dan oh, I'm sure he's incredibly, I'm sure he's incredibly proud of you as a as a father to a daughter I I would want my daughter to have your spirit and your your tenacity and and to shine a light and help others and um oh. Thank you for sharing that and, and no, letting yourself you. uh, so, uh, to talk about him. So that's nice. <laughs> yeah, I, honest to God, your mindset is really, really amazing. I mean, and that, and I think, you know, it's it's a really good moment to draw on the importance of, um, as a parent, I always say this about the words that I say, you know, the word, things that I say to my daughter, the things that I, like, the way in which I lead my life. Even if you know anybody's listening to this as a parent or just you know a coach in terms of I coach people um, and the things that you know, I had the funny enough I had the exact same conversation with one of my students who um, who lacks a lot of confidence and the things that she condition tells herself she tells herself uh, Clara you know yeah. about what she can't do and there's always a but at the end of the, uh, I did excellent really well wonderful but and it's like it's that and you go sometimes you have to be willing to take a risk and you have to be fearful fearless yes. um when you have adversity and it sounds to me that you've taken again do you know isn't it amazing you're you're, you're, you're the um epitome of turning lemons into lemonade you know mm -hmm. you took your dad's passing yeah. and you use that to spring something so your mindset is amazing especially for you know a woman and you, you're yeah. you're a young woman to be yeah. able to have that ethos so did you always want to be an entrepreneur or is it that you just stumble into this world? <laughs> no, so I really? always I always wanted to work with dogs. That was it. Since I was a child, it was dogs, that's it. That's all I want to do. And I was a dog groomer for a long time um, before I adopted the now 13-year-old that I was talking about earlier. And that sort of spot sent me down a path of wanting to understand more. Um, but my mm. dad always owned his own business. He was he was an entrepreneur, I suppose. Um, and he had this... He did? delusional self-belief that he could do anything and he instilled that in me so he he never said you know why would you want to do stuff with dogs there's no money in that why you know 
that's yeah. you know that's not a good choice of career path wouldn't you want to yeah. do something else instead no that never happened it was always if you want to do it go do it then and make sure you do it really well whatever it is you want to do um, you're more than capable you know everything and I I did my I was working full-time throughout my um, BSc I worked full-time throughout my master's I did it all at once all at the same time during COVID and whilst my dad had cancer so it, it all happened all at once and he was like you know what like you got this it's fine um, so yeah I, I there's no what way. did he do was he he <laughs> what was his business he was a nuclear physicist um so he oh wow yeah he was a very 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 intelligent man and that I think that helped a lot because he had this ability to just constantly solve problems like he he wouldn't get knocked back by anything it was like okay well that's a problem and I just need to figure out how to solve it and I think that is a gift that he did give me was that okay yeah that's a problem but instead of dwelling on it or feeling sad about it what are the solutions or possible solutions and I think that's why we've been able to do so well because every speed bump is like yeah but it's just a problem like all you've got to do is solve the problem and then you're on to the next one <laughs> so it's not a speed bump if you just think right well we'll find the solution <laughs> you know do you know i don't know whether you realize um cara how as a leader and a ceo to have somebody with that mentality that can do mentality okay it's just a problem that in itself you're going to always attract the right people clara you're always going to have the right team um because, because yeah but it's not even i'm not even that's not even something i'm saying that's the law of attraction because yeah. you are putting out that energy that says i've got that can do mentality you know even i'm thinking i'm like god how can i like big car up like <laughs> you know i want to like go how do i sh like this podcast is one way in which like the premise of it is lifting all ships lifting other people up and ironically it started again in the pandemic because as a um uh, you know, an entrepreneur, I have an online entity to my business. And I had so many people reach out to me across the world that said, I'm in the pandemic, I can't run my business like normally, how do I function? How do I get onto an online, um, the online platform or the online entity? So I was like, trying to help them as best I could. And I was like, you know what I got to do? Like, how can I make this a bigger conversation? And it grew and I spoke to people in, in my industry that were prominently an online entity to try and say, look, if you, if you're struggling in this current climate here's some simple things that you can do to raise your your platform up but the conversations have now trickled on into being more than that and like hence why uh you know this conversation with you is is so great so going back to the muzzle movement um yeah. what is it that your product physically like has in terms of you know uh, how do you make it what's it made of you know what's the pros of it why is it so amazing yeah. Do you have one of a stupid flash up? Could you got one available? You can just show I, us. I was gonna say, I bet my my dog sometimes carries them in. They're downstairs. I can always text one of the girls to bring one up to me in a minute that I'll be able to show you. Yeah. <laughs> um, yeah, but right. they are uh, they're bright and colourful. So one of the big reasons that I mean it's so simple, but muzzles historically have not been bright and colourful, and I think in part that helps to um, create the link between bad aggressive you know bad. And, yep. yeah. um, and I think when you see a dog in a bright pink muzzle with floral straps you're less likely to think yep. oh that's a bad dog <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah exactly well, some of the you know, some of the um the more uh some of the more robust muzzles they look hideous they look like something you'd put on like Hannibal Lecter yeah and they're so and it just creates a stigma and, and 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 like you said it comes back to that initial uh, thing that you mentioned it's the social stigma attached to yeah. muzzles well if we don't change the look of them it's always going to remain with that association the Hannibal Lecter mask you know yeah. um, this thing is cool so it'll kill you on sight you know yeah. put a muzzle on yeah that's it and so the sort of the beginning besides function so you know we designed a muzzle that was going to you know be comfortable and allow dogs to do normal things a second to that was okay well how are we going to design a muzzle that helps break the stigma associated what would a muzzle look like or if I was going to design a muzzle for a friendly quote friendly dog what would that be and I was like okay well it would be bright it would be colorful you'd be able to change your straps you you know you could mix and match different colors it could match the dog walking gear um, so it, yeah. it was, that wasn't the initial thought. I think it is a huge sort of unique selling point of our muzzles. Um, is that it's kind of like build a bear, but for muzzles. And I have to, I have to also interject and say I definitely think that's a female touch. I, I mean, I might be a little bit <laughs> that might be 
muscles. That might be a level of um, stereotyping, but mm -hmm. I would say it, the muscles that you know probably are prominent in now have probably been designed by men. But just that that one, that feminine touch and just looking at it from a different perspective of going, how can I make this more appealing? So shout out to you as a, a female entrepreneur. That's amazing. Yeah, I do. I think you're probably right. I think the majority of models that exist have been designed by men and they've been designed by aversive men. Um, so men that promote the use of aversives, you know, so quite often the goal there is to make the dog look scary, intimidating, because it is a mean or aggressive dog. I say that in quotes. Um, yeah, absolutely. Yeah, I think being able to come at it from an angle of I don't want this dog to look mean or scary because they aren't. Muzzles shouldn't look scary because the dogs that wear them aren't. So it's, you know, it, it sort of stemmed from that idea and then sort of layers on top of that in terms of like material. I wanted to make sure it was strong. You know, I don't want these dogs to bite people. If they are a risk, let's at least keep people safe. Flexible muzzles aren't going to do a huge amount if <laughs> you're trying to protect your vet's face, for example. Um, and so yeah. we wanted to make sure that they were strong, they were sturdy, and they were really easy to clean. So, you know, the strapping is waterproof because it's just gross. If you've been restraining a dog in the vets and there's primula cheese everywhere, then you want something you can wipe down quickly. And the same with the vets. They need something that's nice and sterile. Same in rescue. It might be going on multiple different dogs all in the same day. So it needs yeah. to be able to be easy yeah. to clean, which again, like it's so simple, but why has it never been done? I don't know. <laughs> um, so yeah, th there was lots of thought that went into every aspect and every muzzle that we design we are trying it on the public's dogs and we are asking the public for feedback so when we you know at the moment we're designing a size for smaller staffies and we have tried it on i think it's 30 staffies thus far every single human that is involved in that process including the staffies guardian and um, whether that's in rescue or you know in a home they have an input as well so they can tell me actually you know i'm a bit worried about this bit here or i'm a bit worried about you know how it fits on the cheeks there do you think i could make it more secure somehow so everything we've done is kind of been built by the people <laughs> for what the people want you know our community have told us we need a muzzle that does xyz and you know xl bullies we need a muzzle that can do you know it's going to be able to be worn for potentially hours at a time um so I needed to be able to do this, this, and this. And so that's what we did. <laughs> we were like, okay, fine. <laughs> that's incredible. It's, it's just the whole thing, Clara, you know, it's just incredible. And you feel like there's something bigger than you at work here from like, it's like a meeting of all your worlds, like your background in behavior, your background, obviously you're a groomer, your hands-on experience at the Dogs Trust um your father's inspiration you know yeah. um and the mindset and creating within you that inner belief then having the dog the seven-year-old dog that had reactivity challenges that fateful day when he bit somebody in the pub yeah and now in 2024 you think my god it's incredible and then obviously ironically the xl bully ban you think yeah. like it's just incredible it's absolutely yeah. incredible you know yeah. how everything is like it's meant to be I do genuinely believe that I, some people call me absolutely bonkers, but I do think that like everything in life has uh, accumulated to this point, even before the bully ban was announced, 100%. six months before 100%. that, I adopted a dog that falls within the bully type. So like, it, it's just everything oh. in life has sort of all the dominoes have fallen and lined up that, and, you know, yeah. landed me where I am. And it's not just me, you know, the team that I work with, I met them all at Dogs Trust, not all of them now, but the majority of them are ex-Dogs Trust. So if I hadn't moved from, because I was at Merseyside previously, if I hadn't moved from Merseyside to Loughborough, I wouldn't have met all of these phenomenal people. And so, it, you know, they wouldn't be here building a business with me. It's just like, it is serendipitous, I think. <laughs> Amazing. And the thing is, you know, I, I mean, I would say that, that you, there is something bright that shines from you and that will shine on you and wherever that is you are absolutely going to do amazing things uh you can just see it you can see it beyond you and I think that you really need to trust that whether that's your dad or what I don't know but I know there is something great that's happened for you uh, Clara this conversation has been absolutely incredible um mm -hmm. there's so many things that that spring to mind about what you're doing um but the you know the biggest thing that really jumps out is the 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 lack of uh, I suppose it's taking risks taking risks and don't be afraid to try things 
Yeah. But what what would you say to anybody that's listening that um, either has a, a challenging dog or has an idea or, or and but their their lack of self belief is stopping them? What would you say to that person? Yeah, I think if you have a business idea or an idea and it's your own self belief that's stopping you, instead of thinking what what if you know what happens when what if this goes wrong you just have to think well what if it doesn't like what when I did that kickstarter at the beginning it was all or nothing if I didn't raise four to six thousand pounds I walked away with nothing not one penny it was all in or all out and so we were all in and we made it happen because we were all in so I think instead of thinking what happens if I don't hit four to six thousand it's what happens when I do when I do not if I do <laughs> so who who uh, are part of your team you mentioned that they're people from the dogs trust just you want to shout out some of the members of your team and what they do and how they make uh the muzzle movement a reality then for sure so i in, i mean all of my team are phenomenal but i have some really really you know special people on my team and i there's no way we would be where we are without them you know all of the supporting excel bullies we wouldn't have been able to manage um, you know supporting this many people with you know fitting days going to events we have you know hosted people here designed new sizes prototype new sizes without the guys you know the, the team here so we've got um, Becky who is a previous training and behavior advisor at Dogs Trust Annie who was a rehab she quit her own dog training business to come and work for my <laughs> business wow. which is completely completely different from what she was doing previously wow. as well as having a young you know a young child at home a huge gamble because she believed in you know the movement I suppose if you want to play into the business name <laughs> yeah. um and then I've got um well there's so many of them but my yeah and I suppose the final person is George my partner who um you know has been helping me since the beginning he only had he only moved left his full-time job in February this year but before that he was you know helping me build every single muzzle by hand from our spare bedroom um you know a job he never applied for and so yeah it, he's been a huge support and a big part of why I do think I can do anything is because I do have a safety net to fall back on which has always been him so mm -hmm. Yeah, he he definitely has been an integral part, even if he doesn't think so. He sort of thinks this is my girlfriend's business that I'm helping to build, but it's not really, is it? He he was there doing the nitty gritty at the very beginning. So. Yeah, I think it's, the thing is um, to have your your circle of people around you that are have the same vision, that yeah. are willing to lift you up when you need lifting. To they are someone to lean on. They're there to to you know go into the uh the phrase of challenges with you that and they're going to stand with you and for you yeah. you cannot underestimate how powerful and impactful they are um and so shout out to your amazing team so yeah. in terms of movement uh so uh, the movement that's why that's <laughs> a, so the muzzle movement i should say um <laughs> where where do you see it going what's the next um legacy or the next step for for what you do oh there's so many so we i mean we have new things happening all of the time i think long-term goals you know like end game goals is to really make sure that every dog has a muzzle that is comfortable well fitting it doesn't have to be ours but i would love for the sort of public's perception of what a muzzle should look like to be different to what it has been for such a long time so you know I want to make sure all the images that are used in promotional material, all of the training material, everything that the public sees has dogs that are represented in well-fitting muzzles. Mm -hmm. So that, I suppose, is the end goal. Um, back from that <laughs> is I would really like to have a fully inclusive size range. So quite often there is this perception that there are some breeds that will never need a muzzle or, you know, why would you want to muzzle that specific kind of dog it will never bite you um so i think for us that's a huge thing making sure that all of these dogs have access to appropriate muzzles because any dog might need a muzzle in any scenario um, so i think there's a lot of um change of perception in our yeah, the stigma. Goals. stigma yeah 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 absolutely and and that's a really important thing and you've mentioned that several times is to change the stigma of what muzzles are muzzles are not just for aggressive dogs or bad dogs or evil yeah. dogs it's to keep dogs safe and to keep people safe 
And sometimes it's just to give a dog a little bit of confidence and a, and a, and a bit of breathing space so they can develop the functionality in society. And I think that's the really big thing about muzzles is sometimes, to be honest, I, I advise clients with muzzles to put muzzles on dogs that don't may not need them as a visual deterrent to people, because then people will get their dogs on the lead as they're approaching. You can minimize the rehearsal of inappropriate uh, interactions so massive you know kudos and shout out to to um what you do as a sideline have you ever thought about going on dragon's den <laughs> so i have been invited on dragon's den oh. twice now. <laughs> um my main worry for going on something like dragon's den is ethics and morals are so paramount to everything that we do i just would not want to sway away and because we've already turned down huge um opportunities with you know companies like pet for home but they sell pet corrector which goes against our you know so we won't compromise on that no. my main worry is that you know if i was to go with a dragon would they expect me to take things or take opportunities despite them not aligning with my moral compass because i can imagine that would be quite frustrating for a dragon if i said i'm not working with pets at home <laughs> so um yeah it's yeah it's on there on the list of maybes one day. <laughs> well, look, what I'd say to you, as I said before, you know, the, the, the light that shines on you is bright and, and uh, vivid. There's not a doubt in my mind that you are going to go into great things. I think you, your father would be incredibly proud of you of what you've done thus far, irrespective of your achievements. But let me say now, to see somebody so young and so bright doing what you're doing is absolutely inspiring. I hope everybody that listens to this conversation will take a little bit of something from Clara. Clara, how do they find out about you? What's your um, Instagram tags and your website? I'll share those in the description anyway. Um, but yeah, just let us know. Yeah, so the Muzzle Movement is at the Muzzle Movement on Instagram and TikTok and just the Muzzle Movement on Facebook. Um, and then our website is themuzzlemovement.com. So super easy to find us. Any questions about anything muzzle related, we do things like, you know, we have gone to rescues and taught all of the training teams about appropriate muzzle fit. We've gone to veterinary centers and taught them all about how to navigate conversations with the public, suggesting that they muzzle their dogs for the first time. We have done, you know, we've gone uh, internationally and supported rescues internationally, bringing muzzles to them and, you know, teaching them about appropriate fit. So we are really up for helping anybody that has any interest in doing right by muzzled dogs because that's what we're trying to do excellent excellent clara I've, I've absolutely loved the conversation i didn't know what i would have happened when we <laughs> into it. it's been great your your everything about you is just infectious i wish you nothing but the best and an infinite amount of success which if i'm honest i don't think you need it but uh -huh. i wish you all the best check out um clara and her uh, her amazing muzzles uh, online i'll share the details if you've liked this podcast just click like and subscribe to be notified of any future conversations of this type i look forward to sharing many more with you and all the best in whatever you're doing <music>